writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business, coming to you from Kobo's headquarters in Toronto. Hey, KWL Podcast listeners, this is Chrissy. And this is Stephanie. And this episode is pretty awesome because we talked to a fellow Canadian, Eve Langlais, always love the home country pride, and she... Um, not only publishes, but she also launched her own writing conference called Romancing the Capital, which recently happened in Ottawa, Ontario. And she gives us more information about how she became about organizing her own conference. And she also gives us tips for anyone who's new to conferences and what you should do. Oh, that's awesome. Conferences are the best. If you are listening and you're writing and you have not yet attended a conference, put it on your bucket list. Go to one within the next year. That is my challenge to you. You will learn so much. You'll meet so many people. They are always more valuable than the cost of admission. So you got to get out there, break out of wherever you're writing, (laughs) and get to a conference. And if you're near Ottawa, Ontario, check out Romancing the Capital, which will be happening next year, 2019. So you have time to prep. Yeah, totally. Let's get into the episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Kobo Writing Life podcast. And today I'm very excited to have Eve Longley joining us. So Eve is a New York Times and U.S. Today best-selling Canadian author. She writes hot romance with a bit of a twist. She is a hybrid author, and she says that she has a twisted imagination and a sarcastic sense of humor. She is well known for her shifter stories, but she's also partial to demons, aliens, and cyborgs. It's quite the spread there. And despite her adventure story, she swears that she's boring as a stay-at-home mom. And then I guess we will see if you are boring as a stay-at-home mom. <laughs> So yes, thanks Eve for joining us on the podcast today. It was my pleasure. It's nice to meet you. So for any listeners unfamiliar with you, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, okay, <laughs> well, my name is Eve Longlet, a Canadian author, a mom of three, married, and I write basically whatever comes to mind. Oftentimes it has shapeshifters and paranormal elements, although I have dipped into uh, space stuff as well too, and even contemporary romance. Um, I've been writing since 2009, so I have a lot of books, <laughs> a little what? bit for everybody. So did you know you always wanted to be a writer? When I was a teenager, I loved writing. So I mean, I, was, I took every creative writing class I could. I wrote short stories. Um, and then you hit the real world and you're working <laughs> and you get married and you have kids and, and you're lucky if you can find five minutes to read every night. And it wasn't until much later, I was in my mid thirties that I started writing again. Perfect. So you're a hybrid author. Yes. How is that reflected in a typical day for you? Do you like do your self-publishing stuff first or is just whatever happens? I have so many more self-publishing titles than traditionally published titles. So 99.99% of my time is with my indie stuff, to be quite honest. Um, I mean, my St. Martin's stuff, I, I write for St. Martin's Press. When I write a story for them, it's basically I write the story and then I hand it off. And there's not much else to do until they kind of release it. Indie publishing stuff, it's a constant thing. I have to keep a track of numbers and make sure everything's working fine on them, on the stores, my website. Um, if there's adjustments that need to be made, sequels that are coming, I'm in charge of my own promotion. So there's a lot more work involved with those titles. Do you have a preference between self-publishing and traditional? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, six titles to 100 and something, yeah. I mean, I, I did start out with small press. I mean, I had something like 30, 40 titles with small press uh, back in the day. And then, unfortunately, most of those companies shut down. And, I mean, it was a great start for me. It was fantastic. But then once I discovered self-publishing, uh, that was the way to go for me for the control. You initially just wanted to have more control when you started self-publishing? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I was fascinated by the idea. I was reading all these articles about it and seeing some authors that were dipping their toes into it because I was in, I started it in 2011. And I saw people dipping their toes and I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. And at that point, I'd been writing for a couple of years and I had a bunch of titles under my belt and I thought, let's give this a try. And my first book I did self-publish was The Geek Job. You know, simple paranormal romance. And it did well. And then I thought, oh, let's do this again. And then there was Delicate Freaking Flower and Bunny and the Bear. And lo and behold, my self-publishing titles were the first ones to actually give me titles that were popular and hitting and trending, um, which I thought was really fascinating because I was the one in control from start start to finish. Um, Mm -hmm. And they did really well compared to my other titles. That's great. That's a good success story. (laughs) So you write in over 10 some genres. I was looking on your website and you had so <laughs> many lists. I'm like, there's basically something here for everyone. Yeah. So do you find that there's pros and cons to having such a varied backlist? Yeah, the pros are is that if somebody likes my style of writing, then they have a lot of books to read, tons, tons of books to read. And they're not going to get bored because it's always the same, you know, 
ship restored or the same vampires, etc. There's a variety of them. The bad side of that is if somebody starts one of my series, let's say they start with the Lion's Pride, which is, you know, hilarious romantic comedy shifter. That's great. And then they go to something that's a shifter still, but more serious, like Defying Pack Law, the Pack series. It's not the same, right? You'll have one that's high humor and, and laugh out loud. The other one's very somber and drama. Um, so in that case, then you have to hope that the writing um, is what keeps drawing them in as opposed to just that one particular type of story. And I have people who won't switch between them. Some people don't oh, like, wow. right? You know, some, yeah. some people like shifters, don't like aliens. Some people like paranormal, but don't like contemporary romance. And a lot of contemporary romance readers won't read the paranormal as well, too. So how did you decide which series to pu- like traditionally publish? Did they contact you? Or were you like? They contacted me actually. Um, I was um, doing well with one of my shifter series, and St. Martin's Press approached me and said, Would you like to do a series of novellas with us um, to do some anthologies? And I was like, Sure, why not? This sounds like fun. And so I did a bunch of shapeshifters. I did six, six shapeshifter stories in total for St. Martin's Press, um, working with Monique Patterson, who's wonderful as an editor. And it was great fun. I mean, I, I mean, I would probably do it again. <laughs> you know, I'm just lazy about approaching people for that kind of thing. Like, so it was easy because she says, like, what I do. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And then other than that, I'm, I don't have an agent, so I don't go actively out looking for these kinds of things. But if it happens, it's out. I'll look at it. And if it sounds like fun, yeah, we'll do it. Do you consider yourself naturally business savvy? Because being a, like a self-published author, you have, you have to market your stuff. You have to be creative. You got to do the business side as well. So is that something you think you're like naturally at that? I, yeah, I thrive at that kind of stuff. I mean, okay. I was working from home before that as a web mistress and web programmer. And so I already... Web mistress? Yeah. What's yeah. a web mistress? A web mistress. Somebody who just does the HTML, the programming for websites. Oh, okay, okay. I was doing website programming and, and, and stuff like that. So I was already familiar with the internet a lot mm-hmm. as well too, and running my own kind of business as well too. So when I started doing the writing, then turned into the indie publishing, the indie publishing part was great because again, the control, I, I was the one in charge of making sure things were formatted correctly because I like it to be look a certain way. The only thing I don't do is graphics pretty much. I mean, I let, I let cover artists and special people do that because I suck at anything to do with painting and stuff. But when it comes to the other meticulous items, yeah, I like to do those myself. I mean, I have, a, I have spreadsheets, I have, I have an agenda, I keep myself on track. I mean, I'm, I'm self-published and into the future. So, I mean, I've got projects now that I'm working on that are for summer of 2019 and stuff like that because I, I publish quite a bit and I keep track of everything and I have, you know, checklists. <laughs> Being very organized. Yeah, you have to be very organized, especially when, like you said, when you're a prolific author as well, too, mm-hmm. you have to keep track of where all of your projects are in the pipeline. So, I mean, one's out for edits, I'm writing another one, another one is going, is getting formatted, getting put up to vendors for pre-orders, and then there's still the, the back catalog that needs to be tended as well, too. So, do you have your, like, 20, uh, what year are we in? 2019 book list all ready to go? Pretty much. I mean, like I said, I've got books uh, written and pre-order up until late spring. And then I have the books for the summer written and in various processes of editing. And I'm now starting to work on the fall, the fall lineup. So did you learn about this yourself or did you like look to any like resources online to like figure out what am I doing? How do I do this? A little bit of everything, right? Yeah. Um, because you read articles. I mean, I, I, Conrath was the first one I started reading articles about that. Um, and then there was Dean Wesley Smith and his wife, Chris writes, I can't remember her last name, but she also, they had these wonderful articles about self-publishing and publishing in general. Um, There was the Kindle boards as well too. I would go out and take a peek at and a bunch of Facebook groups too. But I mean, back in the day, there wasn't as much back then. Like I said, Conrath was one of the bigger ones uh, to find the information on and stuff. And then a lot of it was trial and error. I mean, those of us who started back then, I mean, it was a lot of trial and error, figuring out how to to format things. We didn't have, you know, Vallum and all these cool formatting tools. And, and, you know, back then even Kobo didn't have their direct portal for us to publish and stuff. So, you know, we kind of, you know, muddled through and got the process down and things got easier after a while. Do you think anyone who is not technically challenged should be like scared to self-publish or do you think anyone can do it? I think anyone can pretty much do it, but you have to have a bit of a discipline. Like I said, Mm -hmm. it's a business. You have to be ready to run a business with it. And you do have to pay attention to details and stuff. So, I mean, when it comes to your strengths, you have to also know where your strengths are and stuff like that. Like I'm good with computer side stuff. So if it comes to computer stuff, like I do my own website, I can do the format. I could do all these things, but when, like I said, when it comes to graphics, graphics I hand off to somebody else. I don't do my own editing. Editing, I have you know a team that does editing for me. Those kinds of things, you know, I don't tackle on my own. But everything else, if I can, then I do do it. But in a, so it depends where your strengths are, you know, because some mm-hmm. some authors can do the, the cover art and yeah. stuff. They can't do the website, right? So. <laughs> 
my strengths are. So speaking of business, Abby, so you actually created the Romancing the Capital Conference, which can you tell our listeners a bit about what the conference is? I like to say it, I won't say it. Yeah, so Romancing the Capital, um, RTC, um, first started in 2015, and it came about because I was doing quite a few conferences down in the States, and I would come back and I'd post all these great pictures and how much fun I had. And the thing that came up quite often was, oh my God, I wish we had something like this in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I looked around and I was like, I couldn't find anything like that in Canada. I mean, there were signings, a little bit of signings here and there, but it was just a little like couple hour thing. And I wanted something a little more immersive. One of the things I enjoyed when I go to reader conferences is to be able to get up close and personal with readers. Um, I like to be able to sit down and, and, and have a chat with them where they can ask me questions and they can talk to me. And I wanted to give that same experience to my Canadian readers. And I wanted to give that same experience as well to some Canadian authors too, as well as bringing in American authors for Canadian readers who wouldn't necessarily meet them. It's grown. I mean, uh, usually now in the last two years, we get about 250 readers that register and we have about 40 to 45 authors that attend. It creates a very intimate event where they get to spend time on panel where we talk about different kinds of books and they can ask all kinds of questions where the authors will lead some you know fun events uh, where you know people they can play with the readers and have fun and giggle and laugh and then all culminating in the book signing where the readers who have now met these authors uh, get to go see them get their books get their autograph and give a lot of these authors some of them who are just starting out even um, the rock star moment because when you're an author you don't get that rock star moment often I mean most of the time I mean I've got my hair blow dry today that's great <laughs> This morning, I was wearing, you know, like just my track pants and stuff, and, and yeah. I mean, my hair was like this, and you know, and, 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 and Carly Gnarly looking, and that's the life of an author usually, right? I mean, uh -huh. if you have to wear a bra on to go out, we're like, oh, man. Really? <laughs> so having the conference is a way to give these authors who are usually working also very secluded, not seeing people too often, not always talking about what they do because not everybody receives romance very well, that moment where somebody goes, oh my God, I read your books. And there is nothing more exciting than seeing an author get that first moment. And RTC can do that for them. And That's it's so also great. great to see the readers have the same reaction, like, oh my God, you wrote this book. <laughs> it's fun. It's an event full of laughter, which I, I mean, Tara of Kobo went to see it. And it's all about the laughter and the smiles. She was telling me about, I think it was the masquerade ball that you guys had. And she was yes. just saying, all oh, the people in the gowns. And I'm like, Tara, you should have dressed up. You missed yep. that. Yep, she did it. I know, I was teasing her. It's like, we're doing, ste we're doing this. So for 2019, we have a steampunk theme. Ooh, and that's good. Already, already got their you know, dresses planned and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, right? Because they get quite excited. It's an event. It's not just a book signing. It's a three-day, you know, two-and-a-half-day event where you get to go and, and have all these fun times. And then there's a ball on the Friday night where you can dress up and it's, it's for grownups. So there's music and there's dancing and there's prizes. So they have a great time. It's, you know, it's that, you know, a lot of, you know, we get a lot of moms, right? Mm -hmm. um, moms and stuff like that, or people who are, you know, working high stress jobs and stuff and they come and they can just unwind and have a good time and go home with a lot of books. <laughs> yeah. You get a lot of swag when you go to conferences. Yes. Yes. yes we always yes. have people bring back stuff like magnets and stuff. So, I'm assuming, I maybe I'm wrong, but a lot of work goes into running a conference. Pretty much, yes. Um, I'm very lucky in the, in the last year or so, and, and next year as well too, I've got uh, my assistant, Jessica um, Ripley, and she's been fabulous. She's really great at helping me with the formatting of the guide and everything else like that, so I don't have to spend as many hours doing it and stuff. There is a lot of hours into it, you know, because you have to curate the authors that come in so that you can have some really great authors for the readers to meet. Um, there's dealing with the hotel as well, too, to make sure that the event goes off without a hitch. And then coordinating with the authors to make sure the authors can get their books to Canada, because that can be sometimes a little more difficult than it sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you think we were a really big foreign country, you know, so it, and getting just getting all that stuff coordinated and stuff. And then making sure the event runs seamlessly where there's no drama and, and, and hopefully no drama. Yeah. Knock on wood, that never happens. And just making sure everybody has a good time and, and offering a variety of, of subjects that they can go and learn about and have fun with. Were there any surprises you had when you were running the event that you didn't, that came up and you're like, oh, I did not think about this? Or were you I didn't think it would be so popular. <laughs> really? <laughs> I did the first year and I thought, oh my God, never again, right? And then it's like, it's like giving birth. So you, the event is coming and you're like, oh God, never, never, never. And then the event hits and then afterwards you're like, oh, that was so bad. And then you do it again. And every year I have that moment of panic and I'm like, oh God, we shouldn't do this. And then we do it again. And then they have fun. And uh, every year it gets a little bit, bit bigger and it gets a little bit harder because I get a lot of applications and we can't take them all. And then, I don't know. <laughs> I love that. You know, it's like childbirth. 
<laughs> so if someone was interested in like coming to your event for the, I guess not next year, but the year 2020, they yeah. would just contact you or how do you get? Uh, yeah, we're gonna, for the authors, we put out an interest form. So the interest form is going to go out probably in the spring. And then we get a, a running list of people who are interested in attending and stuff. And then we go in and we try to make sure we try to get a mixture of authors coming. Um, and that includes repeat authors. It'll make sure we have local authors. We make sure we have, you know, a good, good Canadian content as well, too. We want to make sure that there's a good bevy of Canadian authors coming. And we also want to have those out-of-town authors that they wouldn't necessarily see. Um, and then we have to balance the types of stories we're going to get, which is also difficult because I'm big in the paranormal. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of readers and, and authors that are drawn to the conference because I'm paranormal. Um, and I try to make sure I balance that, though, with some contemporary romance, um, alternative romance, even a bit historical. I mean, so it's, 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 it's a bit of a balancing act to try and make sure. So, yeah, so as many names as we get, the better, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we maintain a wait list because life happens. Um, and if somebody can't come, then we go to the wait list and it's like, hey, do you want to come and take somebody's place? <laughs> so if anyone needs to know, you can email. <laughs> yes, pretty much. <laughs> so it's a big undertaking, making your own conference. So do you have any tips from like maybe an author or a reader who's interested in like, you know what, I think there needs to be a conference in my town. Do you have any tips for them <laughs> go about that? Keep tight control of it um, because it can be very easy to get um, spun out of control with ideas. I, I, I use the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid, you know, <laughs> or sweet. My favorite. Um, <laughs> keep it simple because it's not necessarily about how glamorous it is. It's not necessarily about the swag you give. It's not about all these things. It's about having the right kind of group of people coming together, authors who are going to be outgoing, um, who will interact with readers and not hide in their room. All these things combined are what makes the good conference and stuff. So it's keep tight control over it um, and make sure you don't just like, don't let too many shiny ideas distract you. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how else to say it than that, right? Yeah. Don't go overboard yeah. with something. Don't go overboard, yes, yeah. yes. And if you have to run it like a dictator, do it! <laughs> exactly. I like that. Well, at least to me, readers are sometimes very shy, and conferences can be a little intimidating. Like, I've never been to a conference, but, like, what would you suggest someone attending their first conference? Like, what should they definitely do? Attend the stuff. Attend the panels. Attend the events. Because the one thing that I found wonderful about RTC is people might show up sometimes not having a single friend and terrified out of their wits. Mm -hmm. By the time it ends, they're practically high-fiving everybody they meet. And I think it's wonderful. I mean, I mean, there's a couple of readers. I mean, one who's been going since the very first year. Super shy lady. And she showed up with her husband that first year, absolutely terrified. Well, now this year, she's showing up without her husband, dragging her new girlfriends along, going, we're going to here. And she's, you know, it's, it's her girl's weekend now. And it, it's such a, a beautiful change to see that mm -hmm. she's come out of her shell because she's found her people. And that's one of the things we say sometimes. But, I mean, romance conferences in general, it's finding your people. Because sometimes the romance genre gets, you know, pooped on a lot, shall we say. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, for lack of a better term, people tend to sometimes look down on it. So when you tell them that you write or read a romance, you get that look, you get that huff, you get that comment. You go to a romance conference and you're not getting that. You get to a romance conference and suddenly it's like, oh my God, you read her books too? And then next thing you know, they've got something immediately in common mm -hmm. and they become friends. And there's a lot of people, like I said, who've met at conferences and have gone on to become friends and they keep in touch online and they meet up at conferences again in the future. Um, and it's fabulous to see them because, you know, the clicks keep getting bigger and bigger every year, which is yeah. awesome to see. That sounds great. So you gave us a Yeah, you got to come, right? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell them. I'm like, I got to go, guys. <laughs> you got to come, yes. So you've, like, briefly mentioned, but any hints for the next conference next year? So the next conference is happening the first weekend of August, so August 1st to 3rd. Um, oh, and it's in yeah, Ottawa. Always in Ottawa, always at the Holiday Inn in Canada, because they're fantastic. Absolutely love them. And, um, yeah, August 1st to 3rd, the Thursday afternoon, will be um, writer, writer panels, uh, start out with writer panels, where we do craft um, and publishing. Kobo mm -hmm. will be there. Um, along with Find Away Voices, and uh, we're still working on some other guests. And then that evening, we're going to be starting it off with, uh, and we've got snacks with Mina Carter. She's going to be hosting a snack reception, and there'll be some other stuff. And then Friday, we jump right into it with panels of, about all kinds of romance stuff. Um, we're going to have a special luncheon on the Saturday with uh, Michelle Pillow. And then that night, we've got our, our balls, our steampunk balls that are being hosted by a whole bunch of people, Shannon Mayer included. And then Saturday, Millie's World is hosting the lunch on Saturday, but all morning long, there's also more panels and games. And then the big signing on the Saturday afternoon. 
so yeah so it's, it's i mean it's, it's coming along already <laughs> yes you got a lot down already yes, yes so if anyone's interested in attending do you have a website where they can i do it's, it's, a, it's a bit of an odd one because i, I didn't think at the time it was going to take off so we did it off mine and it's mm -hmm. orc o-r-c dot e longled.com because it was supposed to stand for ottawa romance conference and then when i spelled it out realized it spelled orc like a troll but it's okay <laughs> yeah, so o-r-c dot e longled.com you can also find it on my site under events um and if you go there we still have, we have a few reader tickets left not too many it has sold quite well um so we're gonna have a full crowd next year and uh, our author lineup is already posted as well too we've got some really great names coming millie tayden shannon mayer we got robin peterman we got denise groper swag i mean we've got some some beautiful people coming next year it's gonna be lots of fun sounds like it's gonna be fun yes <laughs> i hope so <laughs> well you said you didn't think it'd be as popular but it is no. I did it next year. I say they always ask, "What about?" And I'm like, "Let's wait and see how it goes. <laughs> it goes well, no drama. Then we'll discuss it again." <laughs> but it's been a success. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, yeah. Like, it's not going wood. Not going. I'll knock on wood for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I read a lot of romance, and I find I'm always the person that's like, "Oh my god, you need to try this." Blah blah blah. So, like, what drew you? To writing the romance genre i just i like the happily ever after i mean mm -hmm. i've been a big romance reader since i discovered kathleen woodwiss and i read the book shanna and uh, she was my first romance book and i read it and i was like oh, right and then <laughs> no i was on a rampage for romance this was like in grade seven so i went on a rampage for romance and uh, you know joanna Lindsay, and i mean i went through all of them and then discovered at one point the paranormal but there wasn't a lot of it at the time mm -hmm. um, which is why i think was drawn to writing it when it came time turn for me to try and do it um was i didn't find there was enough paranormal romance out there to make me happy but uh, i just i like the happily ever after i like the chase i like the dialogue i like the, the the flirting the teasing i like all those things about it i think that's what draws me to it and then you know you throw a bit of action in there as well too um, and, you know, becomes one of your, like, movies you watch on the screen. Yeah, funnily enough, but, like, <laughs> My Normal Romance was the first romance book I read. My, like, roommate had it. She was blowing through, it was Cresley Cole, Immortal yes. After Dark. She was blowing through yes. all of them. Yes. And I was just yes. like, what are you reading? And she gave me them, and then I was like, oh, I'm never going back. Yeah, yeah, it was like crack, right? <laughs> Literally, I, was like, I don't think I've read 12 books in, like, a span of two weeks of my entire life. But yeah, like, and that's the thing, right? You, you find something, and all of a sudden it's like, I can't have enough, and I need yeah. more. Um, and sometimes that's what the writing becomes as well, too, and stuff like that is like, okay, if I can't see what I would like to read, then I just go out and write it. And that's, that's kind of where it comes from, is you sit down and you write what you see in your head, the movie in your head. Yeah. Do you have a preference of what romance you tend to be drawn to? I really like urban fantasy a lot, actually. Yeah, I'm really big on the urban fantasy. It's so hard to find. In it. Yeah, I love, I love it. Like, I mean, Dorinda Jones, and uh, I've recently been reading Deborah Dunbar's M series. They're fun. They've got humor. They've got action. They've got the paranormal elements, Layla. And there's that romance in there. Um, so, you know, it hits all my happy spots. So if anyone has never tried a romance before, shame on you. But do you have any recommendations, like a starter romance pack that they should try? Oh, good. Of uh, mine? Oh. Of yours or and anyone else as well? You know, the problem is, is, is it depends on if they're contemporary romance or paranormal romance. You, you really can't, you know. <laughs> like, you can't mix them. Joanna Lindsay was my go-to for historical, right? So yes. I got Joanna Lindsay for my historical. I used to do Harlequin when I read, read contemporary back in the day. Harlequin was always my go-to for that. So it was a good, feel-good, modern-day story. Um, and then when it comes to paranormal romance, I mean, you said Cressley Cole's one of the great ones. Bo Walter's older series especially. I love those a lot as well, too. And then I love Ilona Andrews which does a bit of urban fantasy and the romance as well, too. Sorry, which one was that? Ilona Andrews. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you got to have them, right? You know, and That's then, a wife yeah. and a husband duo, right? Yes, wife and husband team, yes. And it's, I mean, their world building is fantastic. Yeah. Epic, just epic stuff. <laughs> I think, so yes, everyone needs to try those. Yes. <laughs> Do you have, like, one popular uh, book of yours that everyone has been like, I've read this one and loved it so much. The problem is, is I have a couple, because I read in different genres, I have a couple different. Oh, one of each? Ones. Yeah. My biggest selling ones, um, the ones the ones that hit the New York Times were the, the Lion's Pride. The Lion's Pride, first four books. It starts with Win an Alpha Purse, which was a shapeshifter lion hero. And there's a human hairdresser who cuts off his mane because she was pissed at him. Oh um, my God, I love and that. And then it <laughs> goes on from there, right? Yeah. So that one was extremely popular. That, that one's more of a slapstick comedy and stuff. I mean, my, uh, my contemporary romance, Assassin Next Door, has been very popular, too, if you're not into anything that's paranormal and stuff. You know, the assassin who lives next door to a single mom, um, and she's got Ooh. problems, and he kind of helps her out in his own way, right? So, yeah. I mean, it really kind of depends on your particular taste. But, I mean, uh, for the most part, 
Yeah, those would probably be the two I'd recommend, depending on what you want. And in between them, there's purple aliens and cyborgs, too. <laughs> you got everything. Everything. Someone will find something. <laughs> there's a little bit of everything. Yes. So just switching gears a little bit, is there any mistakes you've made or advice you wish you had when you first started publishing and self-publishing back in 2009? You know, I was always very meticulous right from the start with it. And like I said, there wasn't many tools back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, my advice usually was for people, because the thing that, that scares me the most that I hear is, is people who say they're not going to edit because they can't afford an editor or they think they can self-edit. I think that's one of the biggest things I see that's an error that you should always invest in is a good editor. Um, somebody who's going to catch the plot line holes, who's going to catch the grammar errors, et cetera, et cetera. And to also use a professional cover artist. You don't see that as much anymore now, but back in the day, <laughs> they do it themselves to save a few bucks and the results aren't always pretty. You know, like th those are the things like I said, your presentation really has to be spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, that you only get a chance to make that first impression once you want to make sure that it grabs people's attention. I mean, cover and editing are always the two things I'm like, don't skip on those. <laughs> How does someone find an editor? They're like, they wrote their first book. But they're like, you know what? I need it edited. Is it there? Well, like, there's all kinds of places you can find them. I mean, I lucked out that the ones I found were either word of mouth from other author friends. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them was actually was a freelancer who worked for one of these small presses I used to, to write for. And when I approached her, she's like, yeah, I do freelance. And she freelances also for the big publishers. So I was like, yay. So, I mean, that's how I kind of found them. But you can also find them on, like, Kindle Wars has a writing, a writing group that has a listing of all the editors you can get. I believe there's a national um, editing website. I can't remember the name of it. There's one in Canada and in the United States, basically, that have editors listed as well, too. And you can find some. Um, but oftentimes, if you belong to any kind of author group and you post a message and say, I need an editor. You're going to have a whole bunch of people saying, here, here's mine. She's fantastic. Um, and you'll get to pick and choose who you want to use. Yeah, I find everyone wants to help everyone else, which is very nice. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. It's a very helpful community, yes. So do you have any tips for struggling uh, writers who are just like need some tips? They're having a hard time finishing their book. Well, what helps you write? You know, you the writer's blog? Uh, have a shower. Um, <laughs> <laughs> get your best ideas in the shower, right? In the shower or when you're driving your car. Those are two places you can like unwind and, and try, you know, sometimes talking out the storyline if you're running into a difficulty and stuff. I'm, I'm not a person who likes writer block. I don't like that word because I'm prolific. And the reason I'm prolific is because I have ass in chair every single day for a set number of hours until I get a certain number of words written. And the people I know who are doing well at this, who are also prolific, same thing. You know, ass and chair, right through it. If your story is not going and you're, you're staring too long, you need to go back and your story, um, read through and figure out where you went wrong. And if you still can't figure it out, then run, run some ideas off people's heads. You know, start talking about it. Because sometimes the process of just talking about it out loud, you all of a sudden go, oh, this is why this doesn't work. I got to do this this way instead. And you change things up. And sometimes you'll have to do some rewrites. And sometimes you'll have to take parts out that you're like, I really like this part. Too bad it's gone. Ultimately, the story has to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A fun question is, what have you been loving lately? Recently, we had Shayla Block on the podcast, and she was talked to us about video games, which I have never played. But is there mm -hmm. anything you've been loving lately, like books or TV shows, movies? So I just finished the Salem series, actually, with my daughter, all about witches. Gory, 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 gory storyline, but fabulous to watch because it fed our paranormal, paranormal love. Um, and I'm, I mean, I have a phone, and I'm always playing Candy Crush on it. Uh, <laughs> I, I like the, the mindlessness of it. So when I work all day, I mean, I write, 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 write all day. After dinner, I'm not allowed to write anymore. After dinner, I can do a few emails, and then after that, I'm supposed to relax with family. Um, and I do that with what I call mind-numbing. So I'll watch, you know, some sitcoms or some, some, some television shows, or I'll play Candy Crush because I find it very relaxing. <laughs> I wonder what do. level you're on. Uh, I, yeah, we won't discuss that. It's pretty <laughs> um, Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. But it's the way my mind kind of, I guess, reboots and resets so that the next day I can get sit back at my desk and start writing again. So what are you working on for any fans wanting to know what should they be looking out from you? Well, you yeah, well, I just revealed, I revealed this week or last week, a co the first cover for a new series I'm doing called The Chimera Secrets. And it's actually in the Canadian Rockies, oh. um, hidden medical facility, right? Doing experiments on humans. And it's fabulous. The first book's A Nurse on the Wolf Man. And the second book, which I haven't named yet, is, is done. So I'm working on the third book for it because I want to release those next summer. Um, and just kind of have them come out one after another. Kind of like their paranormal slash monster romance, kind of pulp style. The, the, I mean, the covers are fantastic for these. I'm really excited about this series. So, yeah. And it's fun, right? Because it's, yes. it's new, new territory. I always like it when I get to develop a new world. So that makes me really happy. And that's coming out next summer? Yes, next summer. So every month? Yep. <laughs> it takes 
a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I write a lot of category romance. So a lot of my books will be in, uh, usually end up being 45 to 55,000 words, um, which is a category romance, which is about the old style Harlequin size, right? Yeah. Um, so about 200 or so pages, which is beautiful. If you, if you only have an evening to read, you can sit down, you can read it in an evening, and mm -hmm. it's fantastic. It's not a doorstopper. Yeah. Perfect. So where can listeners find you online? <laughs> you can find me on my website, uh, evelongled.com. I'm also on Facebook. I have a personal profile under Eve Longlet, and I have an author profile that you can come find me at. My author profile also has my group where we're going to start putting little teasers and stuff. Um, I'm kind of on Twitter, but not actively. So Yeah, um, Twitter's a hard one. <laughs> you know, your best bet is usually to find me on Facebook. I'm very interactive on there. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been great talking to you. Oh, thank you. We really hope you liked that episode interviewing Eve Longley, a fellow Canadian. And um, if you missed our announcement last time around, you should know that we are now weekly. releasing these episodes weekly. Yes. So we'll have an episode every week for you. Yep. So keep listening. Thank you for subscribing. Share with your buddies. Give us a rating and review. We truly appreciate it. And if you would like to be on our podcast or you have somebody you'd love us to chat with, let us know. Writinglife at Kobo.com. And thanks as ever for publishing with Kobo. It means so much to us. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Bye. for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we provide insights and stories from leaders and experimenters in the world of self-publishing. If you want even more information about growing your Kobo sales, check out our blog or find us on social. And if you're just finding us and ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing!